You're live. Hi, everybody. My name is Bobby Sanabria, co-artistic director of the Bronx Music Heritage Center, the BMHC, the place to be, along with Elena Martinez, who is the, also the other co-artistic director. And as you know, because of the pandemic, we've been doing a lot of live streaming events, particularly this one every week, Percussion Discussion, where we uh, do things where we uh, give you examples of uh, various artists in different traditions in the world of percussion. I myself have done a few of the, these percussion discussions talking about various aspects of Afro-Caribbean percussion. But occasionally we get to interview someone who is part of our many traditions. And in this case, tonight is a special evening because we have one of the foremost authorities on the music known as Bomba en Plena from our querida island, our beloved island, our ancestral homeland, Puerto Rico. He has a fascinating uh, career that we're going to cover. He is the uh, winner of the National Endowment of the Arts Heritage Award for his fantastic work in preserving these traditions and passing them on and spreading them out, not only through Puerto Rico, but of course here in New York City and throughout the world. He's got a fascinating career that you're going to find out a lot about, especially the people that actually know him and work with him in his group, Los Pleneros de la 21, who probably don't know a lot about his background uh, being trained as a formal musician. So please welcome the great legendary Juan Gutierrez here to Percussion Discussion. Juan Go, as he is known by everyone. Como tu ta? Thank you, Bobby. Este, uh, tú eres muy generoso con tus palabras. You are so generous and kind with your words. And thank you, Bob. You know, it's really lift me up the spirit, you know, on the, this uh, trying times, difficult times. And, uh, I, you know, like, like I was, uh, we were talking before we were in live and on the air. And, uh, you know, I've been good. My family's been good. But I really feel, really feel, feel for those people who have really have a hard, hard time themselves with their families. And I, you know, I'll always have them in mind for all New Yorkers of all Latinos. Okay? Que... Fantastic. And we welcome everybody that's viewing. We, we'd like to remind you that uh, at, toward the end of percussion discussion, you'll be able to submit your questions through the live chat, and Juango will answer your questions. Juango, vamos a... Empezar en el principio. Let, uh, where are you originally from in Puerto Rico, and where, uh, where, when were you born? Oh wow, well, <laughs> that that was a long time ago. Okay, I'm 69 years old. Okay, I was born May the 8th, 1951, in Santurce, Puerto Rico. Okay, Santurce. Uh, most of you might know, but it, that's a municipality of the capital city of San Juan. But very. Uh, Mysterious place. I was very diverse place because it, uh, you know, there were the government buildings, uh, the big businesses, all but the arts and the media was there, and the musicians used to live there because that's where it concentrated in the 50s and 40s and 50s, you know. So uh, I guess you know, not only because I live there in the metropolitan area, that's what we call it, you know. But I think because of the island, Puerto uh, the Puerto Ricans have this very particular quality. I guess like Cuban, like Dominicans, all the Antilles, we have that persona, that uh, you know, that thing about being musical because music is part of our daily lives. We cannot live without music. It's like uh, you know, it's like the air we breathe. Music has to be there, but I, you know, not only for musicians, for people who is for everyone, you know. Now, the music you were listening to when you were young, was it these traditional forms like bomba plena and, of course, la música jibara, which is the jibara, which is the music of the mountain people, the farmers, etc. But were you listening? Besides that, were you listening also to what we call American popular music, like jazz? r and b you know, uh, uh, rock music etc were you listening to all those things at the same time well yes when i was basically when i was a teenager you know i started you know like uh, going on my own listening to stuff like uh, jazz and, but rock and roll was very popular in those days as you know 
and uh, it was all the time in the radio. For jazz, you have to be selective and try, you know, uh, there was a, the government uh, uh, radio, WIPR, had, uh, they had uh, like a weekly program of jazz and that it was incredible. And also on black and white TV, I remember this program, this show is called, probably you know it, Bobby, it's called Jazz Scene USA. Oh, right. Yes, yes. Oh, my God. That really blew my mind because the, all the big bands, all the great cats were playing there. They, you know, they were featured there every every single week. You know, it was recordings of, of shows that they did and concerts and stuff, you know. I remember the show well. It was in black and white. It was, yeah. It, yeah. Yes. And now, so, when, when yeah. uh, from uh, the little that I know of your background, uh, you got a set of timbales which is, yes. for those of you who don't know what timbales are, the instrument that Tito Puente made famous, you got a set of timbales when you were eight, nine years old uh, from that's, your that's father? Correct. You know, I um, I used to be banging on, on, on the tables, on the, the la lata de galleta, you know, and the, on the desk, and uh, teachers were, you know, calling on uh, my father, my mother, they were complaining because I was banging on, on the desk all the time in school, you know. I said, well, what, what's wrong with this kid? You know, well, uh, and my father just told the teacher, he just likes music. You know, he he just keeps banging. I guess I gonna do something about that. I think, oh, I'm in trouble. And so on my seventh birthday, okay, he went to uh, this, it was a, a music store. I, I learned after that, but it's, it was called Fine Piano. In Santos, La Parada 20 y la Avenida Ponce de Leon. I remember because, you know, he told me after that, uh, he got me a set of timbales. Bobby Gretsch timbales. Wow. <laughs> wow. Do you still have them? Yes. <laughs> That's the collector's item. Yeah, yeah. It's not the Lady Ludwig, you know, that everybody has. I have two pairs of those. Not one, two, and then the great <laughs> timbales, Gretsch. Wow, wow. These are collector's items. Uh, he's talking, the Liri timbales the, uh, that he's talking about, the Liri company, uh, were known for making the finest timbales of that time period. They were the instrument that all of the masters, Willie Bobo, Tito Puente, used. And, but the Gretsch timbales he's talking about are even rarer. So yeah. the, he, it's fantastic that you have the, those. Maybe on... Your Facebook page one day you could take pictures and post them on there for us, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we could all salivate as percussionists. Oh know? yes, oh yes, indeed. So at that time period, you get the team ballers. Did did you basically at that time did you teach yourself or was it somebody in the yeah, neighborhood who taught you the basic about, things? Yeah, exactly. You know that the on the radio there's always music and I was always listening to Cotijo because Cotijo was daily there. You know, five days a week. He was on the radio, the, uh, I showed them Mediodía in WKQ Radio, right? And that was a live show. It's a variety show, but they started, you know, and they played uh, four or five songs throughout the show, along with all the singers and artists, right? But then, the Cotijo was all over, you know, on TV and the La Fiesta Patronales, in, in many, many other events, public events that you were able to, you know, to enjoy and by free and also you know other other places my father was a music lover you know so he used to play records all the time i remember uh julio gutierrez el conjunto batacha wow mm -hmm. yes and uh, of course uh, julio gutierrez perez prado also of course tito puente benny more of course and mm -hmm. all those 78 records that my father used to collect, oh man, I, I had a ball, I had a ball. Fantastic. Now, for those of you who don't know, Rafael Cortijo is an iconic figure in Puerto Rican musical history. He uh, is responsible for adapting a lot of the typical uh, bomba rhythms that we use, particularly the sica, to dance to the dance band format and spreading that out. And uh, so those of you who don't know who he is, you should definitely check out his recordings. You could start by going to YouTube. There are many recordings that he's done. Very, very influential. 
Now, at that time period, when did you formally, I know that you had some musical training yeah. when you were young. When did you start formally taking music lessons and learning about theory, how to read, the yeah. classical percussion instruments, orchestral? When did you start doing that? Yeah, I remember my father uh, talked to uh, a young cat, uh, you know, up in the block where we used to live in Caparra Heights. That was, you know, the suburb of, of, San, of San Juan near the Avenida Roosevelt. Uh, so they, uh, he, you know, he, he got this music teacher, he gave me a couple of lessons, not much. And I kept on my own, you know. He and the lessons that he gave you, were they on piano or just theory? It was theory, it was theory, no piano. But, you know, then, uh, then I, up in the block, the same uh, young cat, he had a brother, me acuerdo, Danny y Derry, los dos, they had a, a, a small combo and they used to rehearse in the, in the living room. And mm. all the time I heard, because I, I lived, you know, downhill and I had to go up the hill uh, to their house. And because I, the, I was listening, was, they started rehearsing, I ran up there, just watch and watch, not, not saying a word, you know. They, 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 they were uh, acoustic bass, remember, an upright piano, uh, a trumpet, a timbales. You know who was the, the timbalero? Quique Talavera. Wow. Yeah. I thought you were going to say Mike Malaret from the Grand Combo, but wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And do you remember who was playing congas at the time? Or? No, no, I don't. I know. But I remember Kike because I was, you know, like a boom, you know, wow, wow. There watching every move that he was doing, you know. So it was like doing that like you take you're getting free lessons basically yes. by watching these I, guys. Watching, just watching. And then this this show I I used to tune in down, you know, Cotijo and then I turn on the T V and that was uh uh, uh uh Vicentico Morales. He had a trio with Julito Chan. And uh, Jimmy Rivera, el papá de Jimmy Rivera. Jimmy the Rivera, the, the drummer for yeah. later on with Mongo Santa Maria. So his father yeah. was, was in that group. Was he playing what, timbales or drums? He, he had this setup. He, was, he had a bass drum and a snare drum and the timbales and the cowbell, you know, ting, 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 right. ting, 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 and the, and the cymbal, hi-hat, because they used to accompany all, also uh, uh, singers that were coming into the show. But they had this, como tu llama, at the 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 show theme. It started with a, a couple of mallets on the on the timbales. The one to ruka un pin tin 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 tin. I had that by memory, man. <laughs> wow. You know, I got that by memory. I remember I was practicing at, at home right there, and then ruka un pin tin 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 tin. And there was a, a an old lady with the umbrella. Uh, mediodía, ya miro. Wow, the show already started. <laughs> you know, so you know, so it was, a little, it was, it was listening. Little... You know, it was very, uh, you know, characteristic. It was the symbol of that show. Okay. I remember that, man. I wonder if there's any clips of that on YouTube. Man. Oh my check it. Wow, man. Uh, so you, uh, yeah, that you had great. Be, you had great role models. You had oh, great yeah. role models on the timbal starting off. Now, at that time, did you see any bomba en plena in the streets as a youth? Did you see any pleneros, of that? I used to see pleneros at the, in the Parque de Pelota, Sito Escobar, allá en Puerta de Tierra, in, in San Juan. You know, if you know uh, uh, Parque Muñoz Rivera, when you go to the beach, uh, como que se llama? La, 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 esa, esa playita da, Real, really nice beach in front of Parque Muñoz Rivera. Then you see uh, the the Cisco Escobar uh, Park. That was baseball, the first baseball stadium. Uh, uh, according to me, I don't know. Probably there was something before that. But uh, that's. I used to go to the. My father used to take uh, my brother and me to the to the to the games. Los cangrejeros, whoever was there, you know, against the cangrejeros. And there was pleneros playing there. All now, when you saw these pleneros, did they affect you the same way that the 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 people like Jimmy Rivera and these other guys playing 
the timbales did it affect you the same way or or did you you were well, still more into the timbales mm -hmm. no because remember you know the the, the planeros were you know once every once in a while and then you know i was i was a uh, i live you know in this in a what do you call it in the neighborhood in a suburb of san juan if you want to see la plena la bomba you have to go to the barrios okay you know? and uh you know at that time you know but eventually you know eventually you get to meet i mean the island is so right, right. close it's so tight needed in terms of music and the relationship of people and all that you know i remember uh, la familia cepeda when they started you know when they were performing because i was playing also in bands and they were br they were bringing the shows and uh, la familia cepeda was part of the show and all that you know it was incredible Wow, so those seeds are planted there in what you do now, back way back then. Do you remember the first professional band that you played with? The first like gig that you got paid money for to they called you up, Wango, we need you to play this gig, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, yeah? Yes. Uh I don't recollect his first name, but his last name was uh Cuadrado. I think it was Jimmy Cuadrado on his piano, his piano and his quartet. Right. You know, so I got the first break. You know, it was playing la lounge music, society music, you know, for <clears throat> for big dances, private right. dances. Uh, you had to go on, you know, black tie and all that. I was uh, just, just a kid, uh, 12 years old, 12, 13 years old, you know. And my father used to take me over there, you know, um, with my set of timbales, the bombo and the snare drum and the cymbal to play the, the guarachas and boleros, whatever, you know, the paso dobles, everything, you right. know. Mm -hmm. And that was a, a great school for me. Not only, you know, that was my first professional gig, of course, but a, a paying gig, big professional, no, paying gig, you know what I mean? <laughs> That's, distance years apart from being professional you know right so you're you're starting out playing some professional gigs etc yeah. at this time w were you enrolled in any music program at all at school uh, by that time i was already at the uh, la escuela libre musica and this was a great program from the government you know they used to give uh, this test aptitude test and music and i remember taking the test of this, all these sounds and rhythms, you know, you, know, you have to identify if this rhythm is the same. They, they, they gave you choices, right? And then you have to, you know, do the, the little square. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, I was accepted to school, uh, La Escuela Libre Musica in Atorrey. And that was a game changer, man. Wow. Because that school is like a, you know, school here in New York that, uh, it's, it's a magnet for many other kids from all over the city. You know, it's not from a particular zone or neighborhood. It's from all over San Juan, Rio Piedra, Coupe, everything. So, you know, I mean, the, the, los Hermano Figueroa were all there. You know, I remember... Uh, You're talking about people like Eric Figueroa, the piano player? And, uh... I'm talking about La Familia Figueroa, the, the Guillermo Figueroa, uh, Carmelina Figueroa, the, the Figueroa families, with, you know, the, right. in history, and they all of them were there. You know, as a matter of fact, in that school, all the great music, all, all the cats that were teaching there were professional musicians. Some of them were from the classic, you know, uh, uh, scene, but others, the others were from the, you know, from uh, from the hotels, playing hotels, playing uh, recordings. Remember the Gonzalez Peña? They were the greatest of the greatest. I remember in their desk, they had this, you know, their desk, teacher's desk, and the, with the with the glass, and under the glass, there's pictures, eight by tens, of bands, of their bands. Oh man, I used to I used to go and hang out hang with the teacher, just watching those pictures, and wow. it were uh, mira, ellos todo todo el tiempo eran mm, 
being shot. Oh man, they were you know dapper. You know what I mean? Oh, right, right. elegancia, yeah. Now, when you were there, how many years were you there? Like in that school? I I started in seventh grade to twelfth grade. Wow, a long time. So while you were there, you were studying classical percussion, like timpani, mallets, snare drum, and also drum set, etc. And 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 Afro Cuban, oh, Afro Latin percussion. Yeah. No, it was basically you know general music, but you know it, I was I got in the band, right? But the band is this concert band, and then. Uh, there was no percussion. Uh, the very first two, uh, maybe the first week. So I started with clarinet. And wow. then the teacher, uh, Mr. Luis Gonzalez Peña, um, uh, que Dios lo tenga en la gloria, is a great musician, man. He used to say, anybody wants to go to the, you know, to play some uh, percussion and drums over there, you, you know, I raised my hand. Me? Yeah. And then, boom. From that, from that time on, you know. But listen, I was in the second class, the second class of that program. You know, second year. The first year was a uh, Perico. Perico. Luis Perico Ortiz, the trumpet yeah, player? Perico, per, Luis wow. Perico Ortiz was part of that first uh, year, the first class who gra that graduated from uh, La Escuela Libre de Musica. Then wow. I, I was part of the second class, you know, the year after. For well, those of you who don't know, Luis Perico Ortiz is one of our greatest trumpet players. He became very well known through Mongo Santa Maria and then working as a producer for the Fania Record Company in New York City. And then as a composer arranger and he played with Machito and every band, Puente, etc. And then he formed his own band and the rest is history. Very well known, respected musician, not only in Puerto Rico, but worldwide. That's amazing. And you were playing clarinet. How long did you last on the clarinet? Uh, well, maybe one or two weeks because I was <laughs> started blowing. But then the teacher said, "Yeah, anybody wants." I went there to the, you know, to the percussion section. So said, yeah, no, there was no percussion teacher at the school at that time. Uh, no, there was no percussions, uh, not at all. Uh, there was uh, then they after ye years after like three or four years after they hired uh, Samuel Lipschitz, is an Argentinian, you know. But well, this guy wasn't percussionist. He was a musician. I think he he used to play clarinet. You know, some right, people right. Kind of percussion. But he he knew his thing. You know, so so you were you basically had to teach yourself the timpani and and mallets and all that kind of stuff by yourself then. You know? Yes, indeed. And then and then after I you know I graduated from high school, I went to the to the university, and then I heard about uh, the. Not even the conservatory had a music, uh, a percussion teacher in those days. But then I heard that there was, a, that they hired a percussion a professor, teacher at the conservatory of music. So I went there to audition and apply and I got in. Wow. And it was fantastic, fantastic. Uh, I remember uh, when I went in, there was, I went into this, there was a, like a you know a session a percussion uh section uh with the with the percussion instructor and the, all the students there were all professional percussionists and musicians that were playing you know in the in the hotels and on many other places among them uh alex nesio soup you know Acuna. who Alex Nesosup is? Acuna, yeah, Acuna. Yeah, Alex, Alex Acuna, exactly, yeah. exactly. For those of you who don't know, Alex Acuna would go on to play with Perez Prado, but then he would go on to play with Weather Report, the greatest yeah. jazz fusion group in the in the world, and, and become awesome. a great stay in the studios yeah. in L.A., yeah. yeah wow, but, amazing. So I don't know if you know Rudy Regalado. I think he Yes, Rudy, a, yeah. 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 Yeah, so he was there, too. Wow, wow. Yeah. Uh, all great cats, great. Probably. But they they were they were they were playing 
Latin percussion and also drums in the hotels and in bands, but they yes. they, they, necess, they didn't know classical percussion. They were studying classical percussion there. Yeah, and but they had jobs, you know, you know because uh, these guys are, are top musicians. You know, they were playing the hotel, Vegas, you know, Vegas is part of the Vegas circuit, you know, because all these singers, big stars used to come to the hotels. Right. Uh, you know, so they they used to uh, be uh, the backup uh, side musicians from backup bands from the hotel bands. So I mean, it was incredible, incredible. Now, incredible. from there, how did you get? And, and I'm obviously at that time you're also continuing to gig and yeah. become more well known, especially through your connections with Rudy and Alex. How did you get to the Manhattan School of Music in New York City? Okay, well. Um, I is uh, I stuck you know I, I was there in the conservatory so uh, then uh, there was some conflict that happened that the teacher uh, percussion instructor had to leave and then I left too because I by, by the way who was the percussion instructor do you remember oh, yes oh yes oh yes uh, I'm gonna tell you in a minute uh, because this guy was very controversial the I is a long story Frederick King. Oh, Fred, Fred King. He was a, 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 a close friend with Max Roach. Right, he's African American. Max Roach yeah. to Puerto Rico. Right, right, and he uh, he was part of M Boom, the percussion ensemble. There later you on. go. There you go. So, brother, yeah. you know, well, I'm gonna say this public because it's the first time it happened. You know, they fired him. This guy, he wasn't. You know, it was a, a very, you know tough guy and then uh they fired him and then he sued the conservatory and the festival with well, the festival Casas was was the uh institution that hired the music contracted the musicians to play the Casal festivals and to teach at the conservatory that was the deal to teach at the conservatory and to play at the Casal festival so the Pablo Casal yeah. King and and Frederick King sued them for racial discrimination. That was the first time it happened in Puerto Rico. Wow. He won. He took a lot of money and he left. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Fred King, if those of you don't know, he, he, African American, great timpanist, all around classical percussionist, and one of the founding members of Max Roach's percussion ensemble, and Boom, which I'm proud to say I, I'm, I've been part of M Boom for the last. Uh, I would say six years, you know, so it's, it's, so I know him well, I know I, but I didn't know that, that he had sued the, yeah. that was the story. Yeah. Know? Wow. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. So how I mean, do you get, how do you get to Manhattan School of Music? Yeah, what that happened, you know, he left and then I said, well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to get a job, you know, a day job so I can save some money and uh, go to, to uh, United States, to New York, whatever, you know, I was just saving money. Then I heard that they had hired another another percussion teacher, Pavel Burda from Milwaukee University. And this guy, he was great. He was uh, from Pratt. The Pratt Institute. Pratt. Yeah, the Pratt Institute. Yeah. Oh man, great, great, great teacher. Uh, he, you know, he really motivated everybody. And then, you know, uh, after a year, I think it was a year, a year and a half, he started talking to to some of us, saying, "Listen." uh my contract is, is due soon i'm going back to milwaukee you can come with me you know you'll be more than welcome to come with me to milwaukee and then i said well okay so i applied to milwaukee but i also applied to manhattan school of music why i don't know why but i remember fred hanger was a teacher at the Manhattan School of Music. And uh, I um, taped uh, an audition in Mallets and uh, Timpani, and I think it was um, Snare Drum something, you know. And um, I sent it out and, um, to, Frederick, uh, to Fred Hinger. And Fred Hinger, he got back to me, he said, listen, why don't you come to New York? You're, you're good, you know, I like what you did. Come to New York and audition in front of me. Oh, yo, shit. 
Okay. <laughs> so, for those of you, those of you who don't know, Fred Hinger is one of the greatest timpanists at that time in yeah, the world. So the fact that man, that's amazing. That's amazing. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, I came to, I got married. I got married, and then I came to New York. Yeah, and then I, you know, I went to audition, and then I got in. Wow. Nineteen seventy-six. Wow. So you so did, did and you finished you got your degree in classical percussion from there or? yes in percussion basically yeah exactly right. yeah now who were some of the other teachers at manhattan school of music besides uh, the oh, oh man this guy uh there was so they there were like three of the main uh, uh there was this guy who who passed away um I remember seeing him again in a concert in Carnegie Hall. He was playing there. I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, but these guys, they were tops. So they, you're they, talking about Sal Goodman or maybe? Or... Uh, well, Sal Goodman, he used to teach. He used to teach at, at Juilliard. Okay. And also at Brooklyn College. I went to Sal Goodman. No, no, no. Not to Sal. Morris Goldenberg. I okay. went to his house. He was married to a Puerto Rican lady. Right, that's what I heard. Yeah. yeah, Mo, they used to call him. Yeah. <laughs> so man, so no, but I, you know, I stuck at um, Manhattan School of Music. I, you know, I enjoyed it there. Then, wow. yeah. yeah uh, after three years of, you know, uh, you know Jose Rossi. He was yes. My good friend. He was already, you know, playing gigs, and uh, uh, he was playing with Patti LaBelle, and LaBelle first LaBelle. The trio, the ladies, right? Then Patty, and then he called me once. He said, "Listen, I'm going with Peter Allen. If you want to, you know, have this gig, he was doing a, a Boston truck uh, tour of the Broadway show. You want to show the box with God? He said, "You want that? You want to get this gig? Because I'm leaving. But if you, if you, if you do." You had to come here, be next next weekend to Ann Arbor, Michigan. They were over there for the weekend, doing the show, and I, you know, I was in Puerto Rico because my my boy was born. I was there, you know, with my with my wife and my little kid. You know, it was just two weeks old, and I said, you know, okay, I'm going. So I went over there, and then I sat down in the pit. You know, when I went, I, I saw the show, and I, he gave me the charts. And then when I started looking at the charts, there was nothing there that he was playing. You say, oh, <laughs> no, what's this? You know. <laughs> so I recorded everything in a small cassette, you know, player. And I, I, I don't think I, I didn't sleep, you know, for the whole weekend. Because, you know, they were closing on, on, on Sunday, two shows. And then Monday is dark, as you know. There's no shows. This travel day. Right. So we were we started in Cleveland. And next up was Cleveland. I remember, man. I was you know, I was I, I didn't sleep. I I was starting those, that recording and putting notes all over the charts. Boom, 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 boom. And then I remember the first first night. After up after I did that. Everybody came to give me a hug. Oh man, you're the man, you're the man. Yo, wow, that's that's something. You know, that was that's been one of the, my greatest times, my greatest days. So this you know, was with Patty LaBelle then. Yeah. No, that was with your arms too short to, to box. Oh, your arms are too short to box with God. Wow. That show, man. Wow. Wow. And then you know who was there before before Patty? Patty used to you uh, to do that show. Uh, Jennifer Holiday. Wow. Uh, that was where she started, and then Dream Girls. She did right. Dream Girls after that. Yeah, and then Al Green was was there too later on. You know, with Patty LaBelle, and they hate their guts. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't stand each other, man. Wow. <laughs> Now, when you were in the you, when you were in the pit, right? What were you playing? Were you playing? Were you playing congas, vibes, everything, everything, everything. everything. Wow. even chimes, glockenspiel, uh, tumbadoras, timb I started, I didn't stop after that. 
I did five years with that with that show. Doing the bus and truck tour. Okay. Yeah, and then we did we did uh, San Francisco, we did LA, we we did big cities, Chicago, Detroit. We stayed for a month, and in Detroit, I remember, uh, Buddy Buddy Rich Buddy Rich came to town, and they told us, listen, Buddy Rich is going to rehearse at the ballroom, but you gotta go there and be quiet. That was one of the scariest days I ever, you know, ever <laughs> because this guy was tough. Yeah, yeah. You know, his, you know, he had. <clears throat> For those of you who don't know, Buddy Rich is considered the greatest drum soloist in jazz in the history of the music. If you don't know who he is, if you, you're, you're watching this and you're young, check him out on YouTube. Just look up B-U-D-D-Y-R-I-C-H and you'll be amazed. Buddy Rich, one and only. Yeah. Oh, he was rough. He was tough with the musicians. Oh, man. Forget it. But, you know. Did you and... get to talk to him at all? Or... No. <laughs> you basically <laughs> no. But I remember when we, you know, in those days, you know, we, we traveled all over the country. And I remember every time we went to a, to, to a place, to, to a city, I checked out the jazz clubs. And I saw, I saw everybody, man. So I remember seeing Joe Williams a couple of times. The singer Joe, the blues from the Count Basie Orchestra, yeah. Oh yeah, just just a small, small, you know, small group, and just him singing. Oh, forget it. Uh, uh, so many. I remember this guy. What's his name? The Jewish guy, white guy, uh, who went to. He's from New York, but he went to the West Coast. And he opened. Oh, Shelly Man. Shelly Man. Yeah. Shelly Man. The drummer, the drummer, yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Shelly man from man. Brooklyn yeah, from Brooklyn oh yeah so many so many now you're doing this and and then after that did you get to go did Patty LaBelle hire you then after no, that no, Patty, I, I used I played with Patty a couple of shows but you know I, I you know I stuck she she uh after the show closed I came back to New York and I went back to school and that's where La Plena started get, getting into me, you know. I was already looking for that because since I first got to New York, I, you know, I thought, Bobby, listen, I said, I cannot aspire for, you know, an excellence in music if I don't know my music well. I, I, I thought I knew my music, but no. You never get to know, you know, the way you really want to know. Was there like a, a, a Rubicon, un momento? Was there like a light bulb went off in your head? I've, I've heard you talk about this, and correct me if I'm wrong, that one day you were walking through El Barrio yes. and you heard some planeros, like uh, uh, in front of a bodega, I think it was. And yes. then that, that's when the light bulb went off in your head. Now, for oh. those of you who don't know what the plena is, it's our incredible folklore in Puerto Rico. We use these frame drums without jingles called panderetas, and it's our, like our newspaper, our percussive newspaper. It's an incredibly deep poetic tradition. And from what I've, from, I think I've heard you say this before, but maybe I'm getting the story yeah. wrong. You were walking in El Barrio, Spanish Harlem, and you heard some pleneros? Well, well you know, uh, that was a La 115 uh, between Lexington and Park right there. 115th in Lexington and Park. Yeah. 115 between Lexington and Park. You know who was there? Uh, Benny Ayala. Benny Ayala was Benny there. Benny Ayala, wow. In there, yeah, playing there. I was. I used to, you know, go there, hang out, and uh, just watch very respectfully. I never, you know. They were inside or outside? No, they just were... there. Just, just there on the on the sidewalk, you know. On the way. And just watching and talking with uh, with the cats and just listening. Intently, you know what I mean? You know, musicians listening, you know, things like that. But let me tell you, you, Bobby, and me, we have a history by, uh, you know, taking uh, lessons from Puntilla. Or right, Puntilla, right. Yeah. Bata, the Bata drum, remember right. in Brooklyn? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then I, I was amazed by those, you know, those sessions. I used to, record those sessions and study them and break <coughs> yep. them down and all that. And uh, by that time, I already had, you know, I was playing with Pepe Castillo and Galdo was there, Galdo Miranda, and uh, Tito Cepeda was there also, you know. And I was playing with them, you know, I was playing that. Because I, I knew that, I, 
yo sabía la plena, yo sabía la bomba, yo, no, yo sabía lo, los ritmos básicos, you know, I, was, I had the basic rhythms, and, you know, because uh, by working the, the music, you know, you get to know those, that stuff. But I, I, let me uh, just interject. Yeah. Pepe Castillo is incredible musician. He did a recording along with Edgardo Miranda, who, uh, who Wango just mentioned. Incredible guitarist. He could play anything, sight read anything, and he also was versed in the Puerto Rican mandolin inst like instruments, the cuatro and the Cuban tres, Brazilian music, everything. And they did an album called Máquina del Tiempo. Cortijo, the time machine. Very forward thinking. You could check it out on YouTube, but get the album. It's a classic. So you're playing with all of these guys yes. that are forward thinking in terms of oh, looking yeah. at the oh, music yeah. in a kind of a 21st century way, but yeah. way back then, and they know folklore, et cetera, et cetera. So. And what happens? You know, while we, we were doing all, you know, busy doing all kinds of stuff, you know. Uh, Hanging out with Pepe, um, with uh, with Edgardo, Tito, playing the music, you know, all the time, having a good time, and then uh, doing the puntilla, doing all all the things, and then I heard about Marcial. Marcial Reyes. I, I already knew Marcial because Marcial is already a, a legend. Marcial Reyes Arbelo, foremost uh, plenero. Okay, this is an iconic figure and I, and I a symbol of what La Plena is, all right? So he used to, as you know, uh, Marcia Reyes used to play uh, with Victor Montañez, Los Pleneros de la 110, 100th Street Pleneros. These are all time Pleneros, but foremost Pleneros. And Marcia used to live in New York. He spent many, many years, and he worked here, and he retired. He went back to Puerto Rico, but he came back every summer and stayed for, throughout the whole summer for three, four, five months until it started getting cold and went back to, to Puerto Rico, you know. So they, they have told me, Marcial is around, he, he's, he's um, in New York, uh, he's going to play at the uh, La Fiesta de Santiago, allá in, in, in uh, Rikers, uh, no, no, Wars Island, right? And then uh, allá en La Fiesta de, de Luis Aldea, con one, with uh, with uh, Victor Montañez, I said, "Wow!" So I gotta go there. So my wife, me, and my and my kids, we went there, and then uh, then all of a sudden, I see it, you know, bunch of gente, a whole group of people, and la plena, boom, taka, boom, 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 taka, taka. I said, "Oh, this was there." I was my sad plane, but you know, while he was, he used to do this all the time. Do la plena so he can really get hyped up and warmed up before he going to the stage. So that's how, before going to the stage. So, so, so before he went to the stage uh, with uh, with uh, with Vito Montañez, I you know after they finish uh, one of the songs and uh, there you are, Marcel. Excuse me. Listen, my pleasure to meet you. My name is Juan Gutierrez. I like you know to get together with you. You say. Come to, don't, come to get me tomorrow. Así me dijo, here's my number, call me, come and get me. And that's what happened. That was a Sunday, on uh, Monday, I was at his house on Cortland Avenue, over there in the Bronx. What avenue? Projects, Cortland. Oh, that's in the Melrose Projects? Yeah. Uh, that's where I grew up. Yeah, really? Yeah, at 681. Do you remember yeah. the name of the number of the building? No. Well, that must, he must have lived in my building on 681 then. But I didn't know it at the time. You know, so. <laughs> Mira eso, man. Sí. You know who used to live there too? Uh, and this is just an as a quick aside. The timbalero for uh, Ricardo Rey and Bobby Cruz. Candido uh, Rodriguez. He oh, lived in that oh. building. And his wow. mother used to do my mother's hair. Oh, in that building. Wow. Oh, and wow. he, uh, uh, Candido, yeah, man, he, uh, I think he's, I don't know, I don't think he's alive anymore, but he had a, for those of you who don't know, Ricardo Rey, Bobby Cruz, Ricardo Rey went to Juilliard, tremendous Puerto Rican pianist, and Bobby Cruz, the singer, Doc Cheatham used to play trumpet in that band, and he had big hits, like Hala Hala y Bugalú and things like that, uh, Sonido Bestial, and Candido was the, 
timbala player and sometimes he played jazz drums he could play really good jazz drums but he lived in my building and he had a giant afro yeah i remember when he, he played, worked left-handed right Was he uh i think so yeah I, no i no no he, he was okay. right-handed but okay. he his his brother harry played bongo oh, okay. his brother harry but he yeah. used to he, he then he formed his own group and he had a local hit called soy mecclau wow. soy mecclau soy blanco y moreno y porque soy moreno la jevita me encuentra muy bueno soy <laughs> And he used to put light his timbala sticks on fire. He uh -huh. put lighter fluid on them and he played. Wow. You know? Yeah. But one time at the Corso, that old club, remember? Yes. He went like this, like Tito Puente, and his afro caught on fire. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but that but that I can't believe that Marcial uh lived in my projects. But yeah. maybe uh what year was that? Do you remember? Uh, uh it was in the I don't know if it was already 80 uh, or 79 or something like that. You know? Oh, yeah. So I had left. Yeah, because I graduated from Berkeley in 79. And yeah. then in 81, my parents moved out of the projects. So, yeah. So, wow. But that's amazing that we have that, that, yeah. that simple, yeah. connect, yeah. That yeah. incredible uh, 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 <clears throat> familial collect, uh, connection, to, so to speak. So you go to... The Melrose Projects to study with Marcial. So well, get him. I, I want to go and get him, and I brought it to my apartment, to our apartment right there, 126 Street and Broadway, all Broadway, okay? And then, you you know, my neighbor was Egaldo. Egaldo used to hang out with us all the time with Marcial, and my, my uh, wife used to cook at, the, at dinner and all that. I spent all the whole day. You wow. Know, every time he said, listen, you got to go to the bodega, get some more beer. I go, Monsieur, what's up? It's gone. I need more beer. You know, so all the time. But then I had this uh, boom box with the cassette. I used to, you know, start recording. And what he noticed, I thought, oh, you're recording? Okay. Put that button. He said, ladies and gentlemen, this is Monsieur Reyes, Lenero. This is uh, a very good friend of mine here. A great, great musician, Juan Gutierrez, and a great guitar player, Ricardo Miranda. And uh, we're going to play a song right there for all of you listening. I thought he had a show on radio. You know, and every time, you know, I used to uh, record those, those sessions. Wow. And you still have those cassettes? I still have some. Oh, my God. Yes. And that's, that's. That's what I, you know, so many stories. I used to live in you know, times that I never had the opportunity to live through Marcial. Whatever it was true or not, you know, but I really had a ball, you know, really imagining in my head, you know. So did he, so basically he taught you through like oral tradition, you know, singing yeah. songs for you, etc. Yeah. this song, I wrote it, or this song, this guy wrote it 50 years ago, this thing, things like for that. For example, for example, you know, I, I used, you know, we are so meticulous, uh, uh, you know, percussions about uh, uh, tuning the drums. So I was wondering, Marcel, how do you tune the drum at the panderos? I said, well, mira, uh, it's a fácil. You know, uh, if you take a seguidor, it suena ton, 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 está muy bajito. Tiene que sonar, it has to sound tune. It made a lot of sense. Tone, tone is too low. Tune is higher. Tune, this is right now, that's tone. So I know I have to tune it up right. because it's too low. Okay, and then, and the requito. Oh no, I said, tiene que sonar tan. <laughs> okay, está bien. <laughs> and what about the, the middle drum, the punteado, oh, the punto de clave? Oh, oh, veate, eso es otra historia. Porque lo que pasa, <laughs> You know, he's, this guy's old school, remember? And uh, old school, uh, plena, just two drums. Se ah, I got you, okay. That's and it. Then, but every time they were, uh, Tito used to come uh, to my house also sometimes and uh, playing Le Requinto, and uh, because he he used to, he used to, uh, he took some lessons from myself before me, 
at the uh, Lexington Avenue Express. That, that was it, what is called that that uh, project. That uh, I think uh, Patato was there also, and a lot of musicians, percussionists. Lexington Avenue something, Lexington Avenue Express in the the early seventies. Um, Tito was one of the kids who you know who went down. Talking about Tito Matos or no no Tito Cepeda. Tito Cepeda okay. Yeah. And then I think that was a project that was put together, and uh, Rene Lopez used to help in, in putting that project together. Then Is you talking about the uh, the Henry Street settlement? Is no, uh... no, it was in a barrio. Lex I think it was oh, Lexington okay. Avenue Express or something like that. And, Before uh, we go on, yeah. we have so much to go over. Can I'm oh, going to okay. ask you as a uh, can we go a little bit over the hour? Podemos ir un poquito más de la hora. Oh. Aquí tú le pregunta, a, a Jordi. A usted? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Okay, great, great. Because a lot of people have questions, etc. Oh, Remember, everyone, you can start if you want. You can start typing in your questions now in the chat room. You know, we'll yeah, get to well, it in about about five or ten minutes. You know, so. Yeah, we're gonna fast forward now. You know, and those those times with myself were, were incredible. What happens? You know, he used to you know leave and come back next year. Yeah, you know, next summer, and then I remember. I, uh, the show closed, I think it was in Chicago. I came back to New York. That was in the summer, uh, early summer, like June or something. And then he was already in New York and started, you know, calling him, Marcel, I'm, I'm back. Oh yeah, great, come and get me. And we used to hang out all the time. All the time. Now, how, how many years did you apprentice with him or are you yeah, still about, apprenticing with him? I think him? it was about three years on and off because every time, you know, he went uh, back to Puerto Rico, came back again and back, to you know, when, um, when I used to go to Puerto Rico, I used to go to his house in Bayamón, you know, wow. mm -hmm. something. So anyway, uh, I remember that summer, that was the summer 83. And I used to hang out all the time with him. And then I met the uh, hermano Flores in La Casita de Chema on 158th Street over there. And then uh, we used to play. The South Bronx, yeah. Yes. We used to play all the time uh, with um, Janet Bobo Flores, uh, Patito Rivera, and um, Benjamin, you know, who was uh, his youngest brother of, uh, of Bobo, of uh, Yanni. These are the, the sons, children of uh, a grand uh, Bobo Flores. A, a great uh, percussions, great panderetero, bombero, and bailador de la bomba. Hijo de Eustacio Flores, de allá de la 21, okay? So anyway, so that's how we started, uh, you know, hanging out. And then, uh, I don't know how I got into this club in the, on the west side. Uh, that was on uh, Amsterdam Avenue, one of the projects. There was a, downstairs on the second floor, there was a, 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 a club, a, a social club. And that social club, was uh you know managed by this guy from la 21 cuco se llamaba cuco i was myself of course he said vamos para el bar de cuco allí podemos ensayar you know we can rehearse there all the time so that's how we how that's how we got the group you know we started los, los pleneros de la 21 yeah no what happened was every 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 guy who went there to hang out was from la 21 old timers and then, you know, we got this gig because I was so proud of being around these old timers and these masters of this music. I started, you know, talking to people, uh, going to the to the uh, student clubs, this, uh, telling them, listen, I got the greatest, the greatest folk band, you know, just give us a chance. I went to this uh, to this lady who used to preside the uh, La Fiesta Folklorica Puerto Ricana. I was there all oh, every single day, you know, after this lady. And she said, I'm going to give you a break. Bring that group to, uh, to La Fiesta. So we started rehearsing. And then one of the days of the rehearsal, I told myself, we need a name. Oh, I got the name. The name is Los Pleneros de la Parada 21 de Santurce, Puerto Rico. <laughs> That's the name. That's the name. Wow, that's the full name. <laughs> that takes up the whole marquee, you know. I'm glad you yes, yes, shortened that it. That was you know? that was August 1983 that we had 
you know, on the Fiesta Folklorica, that was the, our uh, the big gig that we had. You know, wow. And La Concha Acústica del Parque, yo. Now, when you did that, was it all just voices and percussion, or did you yes. use... All, so no, all no cuatro, percussion. no piano, no bass. No cuatro, no. Then, you know, but uh, Egaldo, he was my next door neighbor. He was, used to hang out with us, but he was touring all the time with Puente. Right. He used to play with Puente in those days. He was touring all the time. And then when he came back, you know, he used to play and fall around with us. The first time he played with us was at this uh, this gig that we had. Uh, it was a benefit for WBAI at uh, Aaron Davis Hall. And it was a uh, Latin jazz all stars with, uh, you know, Andy, Jerry, everybody, uh, even uh, even, even uh, how do you call it, the, the Cuban uh, saxophone player. Paquito de Rivera. No, 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 the, the old guy. Oh, shit. Oh, man. Cuban saxophone playing with the... Uh, uh, with, with Carl Jader. Oh, Chombo Silva. Chombo! Yes! What's that Chombo Silva? Yeah. Chombo Silva, yeah. And then Egaldo was going to do that gig, and he also did our gig. That was wow. the first time he did. He played with us. And Benny was there also. Uh, uh, um, Gallito, Pablo Ortiz was there. That was the band. And then uh, that was the first time that uh, Eugenia danced with us. Okay. That's now, did you use a, you, so the, Edgardo is playing with you yes. at that gig. Did you use a bass player too? Oh, and a, just, the, just, the, just the Cuatro. Wow. That was amazing, man. That was amazing. Man. Yeah. Yeah, what a history, man. I mean, so you you get inspired playing the timbales as a kid. Yeah. You start playing as a young professional musician. You're you're in Escuela Libre, and then all of a sudden oh, you get to uh, New, uh, New York City through Wisconsin, and et you study at the Manhattan School of Music as a classical percussionist. You're playing with your arms too short to box with God. Oh, yeah, man. Broadway show oh, yeah. and doing a bunch yeah. of other things as well. Oh, yeah. And then you wind up meeting Marcial and the and you have an epiphany and you become so immersed <laughs> and thank God that you did because I must say ladies and gentlemen if it wasn't for this man we really in New York City wouldn't know our Puerto Rican uh Afro Puerto Rican roots in the plena and what we call the bomba now we haven't touched upon your you with the with the bomba how did you get into the bomba like uh... oh my goodness well remember uh you know uh Iyane was there you know um miguel angel flores that's that's his name uh he he was a bombero he was the child of uh, bobo flores a former drummer bomba a plena drummer and a bomba dancer okay and eugenia eugenia ramos you know eugenia la mama de caco Caco's mother, right? Rich, Richie Bastard's grandma. Okay. And let me tell you something. Let me. Caco used to live in the Melrose Projects too, but in the project across from me. So we used to see him all the time walking around in the neighborhood as well. And I used to play stickball with his nephews. Uh -huh. Just real quick, one day his nephews go, "Hey, you want to see all the tuxedos my my uncle has?" <laughs> so we go up. To, I got the keys to the apartment. So we go up to the apartment. We open up the Closet and there's like 30 shark skin tuxedos, canary yellow, green, blue, forget it. And then all of a sudden we hear the door and it's Caco. Hey, que, que lo que ustedes están haciendo ahí? You know, like, and he goes, oh, so you like the tuxedos, huh? Put, put one on. And we're like 12 years old, 11 years old, and we're scared. So we look like a bunch of little kids. He took a Polaroid of us, you know, <laughs> laughing his butt off. But these guys were local heroes. But man, it's just amazing that what happens in the neighborhoods. So, you you when Miguel Flores, you start getting more into the bomba tradition as well. Then yes, yes indeed. And then you know because these guys were they were playing the the la yo lo que es la la verdura del apio en la bomba. You know, el el lo lo los golpes. You know, the breaks and all that. Was, the real deal. Yeah. Yeah. It was not too many breaks. But whatever they did, it was right there. You know what I mean? 
And then a few years after, I remember uh, we were doing a show at Taino Towers at the red carpet. And then all of a sudden, Roberto Cepeda showed up. Mm. He, you know, he had moved to New York. He was he had uh, retired from the army. He was in the army, and uh, I think he heard that you know there was a bomb and plena uh, concert over there, and then he showed up. And then just playing, and you know the big, the red carpet has a real big you know uh, how do you call it uh, the where people, you know, could dance or whatever they could. It was a very flexible uh, kind of space, but all wood. And I remember a Roberto coming in, and we were doing a bomba. He's, he got up and started dancing. And I said, wow, this, we've never seen a guy dance like that before. You know, because Roberto, he is a unique dancer, one of a kind. You know, I mean, uh, the, you know, uh, Paquito, he was our dancer, but he old school, you know, very, you know, the move, movement precise, but Roberto was very flashy, and, you know, he had his own thing. And after that, you know, he, we got him in the group, you know, and Roberto, he really, you know, influenced the way we approached Bomba in, uh, in many, many ways. Now, every, when did you start? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, every guy used to bring something. And I haven't mentioned Carlos Suarez. The um, piano player? Yes. Yes. Uh, and I have to mention all these guys because all these guys brought something very special and unique to the group. And that's what really developed the persona of Los Pleneros. You know, all these guys, the fundamento, you know, Carlos Suarez, Egaldo. Uh, Gallito, uh, Roberto, every, Tito Cepeda, all of them brought something very unique and very of uh, their own thing that really was individual and collective at the same time, you know. So, one of the things that uh, uh, I wanted to ask you about Carlos, he, he I, the times that I used to see him playing with you guys, it was just amazing. It was like he fit like a like uh, uh, the hand going into the perfect size glove because a lot of people that try to play a piano in the plena and bomba style, they're just adapting Cuban guajeos, yes. you know, patterns yes. to, to, the, to the music. But Carlos was the first guy that I ever heard. I go, coño, and excuse my <laughs> French. I right. said, this, is, this guy knows exactly what's supposed to go here and I, correct me if I'm wrong. He was blind, right? He, he, he was blind, but he was he wasn't born blind. But he had this glaucoma thing that run in the family, right? You know, and uh, his father was blind. His sister was blind. He got, they all got blind, you know. But he was amazing, man. I mean, if anybody should have written a book about how to play in that style of music, which is very particular, it it was uh, him. If there's any videos with him with you guys playing on YouTube. Oh, yes. If, and your piano player, go study them because that guy, I mean, it was just amazing. Tell us a little bit about him. Yeah, uh, okay. Carlos is a formal, formal musician, man. You know, he was a band leader, was the first band, Puerto Rican band leader who went to Brazil. And, hmm. the, uh, you know, and the front man, the, the, the singer was uh, Chivirico Davila, you know. And that uh, was, uh, man, an incredible story that Carlos told me, they, they, they went to Brazil, and when they got to Brazil, the, the promoter never showed up. <laughs> <laughs> and they got stuck there with no money, you know. And then all the other cats started calling uh, New York or Puerto Rico uh, for family to send money so they could get back. He, he, he stood there. He stood there, and he lived for six years. Even oh, he uh, yeah. He spoke, he, then he, he learned how to speak Brazilian Portuguese. Oh, yes. Yeah, Portuguese and all that. He just great, great you know, uh, playing all the batucadas of the bossa novas and the Brazilian style. Oh, wow. Now, that's something I didn't know. I mean, amazing, yeah. But, he, you know, he used to play with Cortijo also. You know, uh, I, I've seen pictures on the radio shows. He was playing the piano, Cortijo, timbales, things that they did. 
But you know, these old time piano players, they you they knew how to, you know, approach the piano and all these uh rhythms or all these uh genres of la plena, la bomba, because the bands they used to play all this music before. It's n it wasn't only salsa, you know, and boleros, they used to play oh, boleros, salsas, paso dobles, uh guarrachas, de todo. Brazilian music, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Now, you form the Pleneros, uh, and then you get involved with a group called Viento de Agua that takes uh, 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 Bomba and Plena in into the 21st century before the 21st century arrives. Talk a little bit about that. Wow. Okay. Let me see how I'm going to make this uh, long story short. Well, I met Tito. When our uh, first trip to Puerto Rico with Los Pleneros, 19... Tito Matos. Yeah, Tito Matos. And that was, we went there with uh, Project Dos Alas. It was put together by Roberta Singer, a good friend, you know. And we were playing at the Plaza, uh, Plaza de Armas in Old San Juan. Everybody was there. Everybody was there. Familia Cepeda, because Roberto was part of the band. The whole, you know, Don Rafael, Doña Caridad, La Familia Completa was there. You know, all the pleneros were there checking us out. You know what I mean? You know, and everybody was there. So at the last song, I knew that they were over there and started calling, you know, them to the stage. So I remember this short cat, very fast and what unique player, uh, left hand, boom, boom, ba, 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 ba. You know, that was Tito Matos. And, yeah. And, and then uh, I think I got, I don't know how many years passed that he came to New York. He got, you know, with his wife, he came to study and uh, he started calling me. He said, I never picked up the phone. And then he came uh, to, uh, we met at the um, uh, SOB because uh, there was a show there about La Familia Cepeda and uh, he knew that La Familia, so he called them. So they invite Tito to be part of the, of the gig. So I went there to just check him out and you know say hi to Don Rafael and I saw Tito. He said, What are you doing here? He said, You sucker, I've been calling you for two months. You never picked up my phone. Yo, what? You've been here? Come come next time, come come next uh, next week. And he started playing with us. Next gig he was with us since that time. And then but he had this dream of having, you know, of doing uh, this all uh modern play. The way, you know, it's the new generation, the new wave of La Plena. He was, you know, he's uh, one of the uh, top names that he was, and, you know, one of the guys who really made it, you know, put it there, the new wave of La Plena, Tito Matos. Incredible. Mm -hmm. So he invited me because remember, you know, all the, the, the players who can play this music is uh, just a, a small crowd. You know who can play bomba plena i mean all the percussions in new york can, can sit down and play they can figure it out but you know if you really want to have a sofrito right there you know you call those you know what i mean so that's how it happened so i started playing with him now you know i used to i love that band I and, love you, that band. and you've gotten to work with uh you've gotten to work with miguel zanon oh, who's miguel. Uh, uh who's really miguel zanon macarthur Foundation Award winner, set a, a Grammy nominee, multiple Grammy nominee, yeah. and Miguel in a small group context oh, is yeah, really yeah. utilizing Plena, uh, infusing it even more so with jazz. Talk a little bit about that, working with yeah. Miguel. That was an incredible uh, experience, you know, playing with Miguel and with David also, saxophone player. David you know, Sanchez, yeah. Yeah, but uh, with, with, uh, I remember uh, with uh, with Miguel, I re uh, he just said, "Listen, I remember I met with him. Like uh, he called me, he said, listen, I need to talk to you about a project.' And we, you know, we had dinner together. Bah, 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 and we're gonna do this. Okay, these are the days that we're gonna get together. So we went to a studio Midtown. What's the name of the studio? I forgot. Uh, I was three consecutive days, just rehearsing the music. Those three days, and then next uh." Uh, that weekend we were playing at the jazz gallery. Okay, yeah. Yeah, just uh, three days consecutive. Boom, 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 boom. And after that, the recording. 
you know, we recorded in Brooklyn, big, in Mongo Studio, I don't remember, real nice studio over there in Brooklyn. And then, you know, that was it. A year passed. Then the record came in, or they started touring in Europe, and then they came to uh, to States uh, for another tour, and then they invited. Oba was there, Tito, and me. And then I remember- You mean Oba, Oba Nilo Allende? Yeah, yes. And the first gig was in California, Sacramento, in a club over there. And I said, okay, uh, we have a flight. Uh, we take the flight in the morning. We got there in the afternoon. I said, well, maybe we're gonna chill. You know, and, and we're gonna rehearse. He said, the first gig is tonight. He said, what? We haven't rehearsed the music, you know. They don't, they don't ask you, you know, ah, we need to rehearse. No, they are taking for granted that you are going to listen to the music and everything, get ready. You know how, how jazz musicians are, how musicians, you know, they don't question that. They know that you're going to come forward. And so, oh man. So I went straight to the hotel and started, I, I was listening to music all the time, but then from there, the sound check and the first and the first uh, first gig and we we stuck there for a week fantastic now one of the other things that i must say about juango is that he's been passing the tradition on for ever since he started los planeros by having these uh workshops for uh adults and for children at julia de burgos etc and he's always been forthright in continuing to pass on the legacy and because of that, many bomba and plena groups have sprung up, not only in New York City, but in Connecticut and in New Jersey. So I would say, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, there's got to be, there has to be at least, uh, in the tri-state area, at least 30 to 40 bomba and plena groups in, in the area. And it, even if it's just 10 or 20, that's yeah. still a lot because the, this music is still somewhat uh, under the ground. I mean, I uh, remember when I was a kid growing up in the South Bronx, all you would see is Cuban rumba in the streets, Guahuanco. Mm -hmm. And then I remember one day going to, with Elena to Orchard Beach, and there would always be play, people play, playing Guahuanco rumba with congas. But then all of a sudden, we get out of the parking lot, we start walking, I go, I go to Elena, oh yeah, you know, I'm listening to barrels, bomba drums. We get closer, closer, and it's a bunch of young people playing bomba. And I'm going, oh my God, I don't believe it. It's finally come to pass. People have finally got in touch with their Afro Puerto Rican uh, roots. And we're keeping that, and we, we have to supremely thank you for that, because if it wasn't for you, that would never have happened. So we have you to thank it. And we're so glad that you're here. We're going to take some questions now from the audience from Annette Aguial. Uh -huh. Do you still play marimba? And did you like studying with Fred Hinger? Oh, my goodness. Of course, I, I love uh, it. was very challenging to, you know, to go and, um, you know, um, study with him because, you know, I used to, you know, it's. it's it's about learning the technique and applying that technique uh, to the repertoire of classical music, particularly the timpani in the classical repertoire, you know, very challenging. And, uh, but yes, the marimba uh, is up there and, the, you know, in the attic. <laughs> it's a digging marimba that I love it. I love it. I love that. It's a very old uh, instrument and I really, you know, I'm very fond of that instrument. I need to just go up there more often and, you know, do my thing. Oh, yeah. So maybe we, maybe that'll be inspiration. Maybe we'll hear you play it with Los Planeros de la 21 as a special yeah. thing one day, you know? <laughs> you know, I always thought of that, you know, doing something with Marimba, yes. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> okay, the familia of Ocasio Flores, who he met at Rincón Criollo, uh -huh. they live in the Bronx. And how did they come to hang out at La Casita? Well, it just showed up there. I don't know. I haven't been there in quite a while since this thing started, you know. But I'm sure that uh, there's always people there, you know. It's a very inviting place. 
That's a, now it's on 156 in Brook Avenue, right? Okay. Uh, right in the corner. Okay, just just go around and check the place. Maybe they're closed, but now you know what, you know, how it looks like and all that. And maybe I'm sure you will find people around and you can ask around. They, you know, always, the, you know, you get the right information. Yes. It's a hundred and East 156th Street and Brook Avenue in the South Bronx. Yes. And when we're talking about La Casita de Chema, uh, tell us a little bit. Well, first of all, the Casitas is a tradition in New York City where these small houses made out of wood are representative of many of the houses that you would see in Puerto Rico in El Campo, which means in the countryside. So they're kind of representative of that. There's several in New York City. But tell us a little bit about who Chema was, and you know, because it's called La Casita de Chema, the House of Chema. Tell us who Chema was. La Casita de Chema, yes, that was a home. Uh, many people, majority of people know, but uh, the, the name of the place always been El Rincón Criollo. Or uh, antes, I think it was El Rincón Borincano, the El Rincón Criollo. But basically, Chema was a very uh, you know, this guy was something. Uh, he was a very magnetic kind of guy. You know, his persona, he was so cool. He was so humble. And, you uh, know, he had a... I used to... I love to go there just to talk with him. You know, we we had... We got engaged in, in great conversation, just talking. Not about music, about anything, you know. And I went there just to, you know, to... It's a descargar, you know, just to relax because it's the, the atmosphere of going, of being in La Casita, very nice, inviting place, you know, and then all of a sudden the panderos come up and you start playing without uh, caring about anything, you know, just playing and having a good time. But uh, Jema has always been that kind of a person, always open the doors for anyone. You know, he was like, a, he knew. You know, you know, uh, if you fail in a way, you know, it's your fault. It's not his fault. You know what I mean? Because he's opening, he was opening his heart to you and to invite him, to invite you to his guarida, you know? So that's how many people, yeah, how this place got so popular. And because he had this great uh, relationship with Marcial. And that's how I met. Uh, uh, that, that's how I met him, you know, through Marcial. He said, always uh, talking to me about Chema, Chema, Chema. So that's how I, you know, I met him. Yes. I would, I would encourage everybody to go there. It's, it's a very interesting dynamic. Not just the casita that's there on 156 in Brook, but there's several casitas in that area. It's, it's a very fascinating dynamic. These casitas were built uh, when New York City. The malfeasance in New York City by the politicians caused the city to go bankrupt. And man, there were many open air lots, etc. And these casitas were built by forward thinking Puerto Ricanos as a way of reclaiming their heritage exactly. and, and their history and their culture and reclaiming their dignity as well. So, in all of this devastation, all of a sudden you walk by these burnt out buildings and everything, and all of a sudden you say, Oh my God. I'm in the countryside in Puerto Rico. I don't believe this. Yes. So now that that area has been revitalized, it's still a place that you can reclaim your Puerto Rican heritage. And if you are not Puerto Rican, when you get there, you will become Puerto Rican and revel in our history and culture. You know, so. exactly, exactly. Yes. Richard Pagan said that he has video footage of Los Planeros de la 21 in the 1980s oh. with a blind piano player and i guess that go. means carlos, carlos. Wow. that means really i need your number man <laughs> so okay. uh, the bronze man, uh music heritage center please because this is you know what you're talking about what whatever you have there footage or recordings this is history all right this is a piece of history it's not because of los planeros it's because of the people who are there okay so if uh let's share that uh, if you if you uh, would not mind, you know, just you know, contact the Bronx uh, Music Heritage Center, and uh, you know, we'll follow up with 
with you. Um, well, yeah, we would really love to see Richard. A lot of people are going to appreciate that. Yeah, especially piano players, just to see Carlos Suarez in the, oh, yeah. in the way he approached things. But uh, you really freak me out about the uh, about Carlos living in Brazil for six years yes. and absorbing uh, Brazilian music. Oh. The only other person that I can think of that's Puerto Rican that did that was uh, Tommy Lopez, the conguero for Eddie really? Palmieri. I believe okay. he lived in Brazil for about three years. Uh -huh. And that's why on some of Eddie Palmieri's early albums, you hear him doing tunes like Mañana de Carnaval, uh -huh. things like that, because of, Tom, because of Tommy's influence. Okay. Okay. And that sound that you hear in the background is the sound of the city. We're in the Bronx, so <laughs> I'm in the Bronx. Okay. Anyway, what, uh, uh, here's another great question. What gave you the idea to start the children's workshop? And that question comes from Georgie, from Jorge Vasquez. Oh, well, Jorge, well, you know, Jorge, my, uh, I have to say about Jorge very quickly that he's been a, a great contributor, you know, since he got in uh, the workshops as an instructor, uh, you know, a teaching artist, I would say. He's an artist in the teaching of uh, this journal of Bomba Plena. And uh, he's been a great contributor. And uh, the idea came when Walo Flamero started uh, performing in schools. You know, the advantage we have in schools is that uh, you have a captive audience of kids. You know, they have to watch you. But then, you know, but it's also very scary because they're very honest. If they don't like something, they will tell you. But they will come to you and say, I enjoy the music. I, why didn't you come? Uh, why didn't you call me to the stage? I want to come to the stage with you and all that. You know, since the very first time we started doing those performances in school, because, you know, we were just us playing the music and, you know, showing the, the instruments and telling them stories and getting them to play right there. We bought, we, we got this set about 10, 15 set, uh, uh, Panderos, Remo, Panderos, we still have them. Great Panderos, very light uh, for, for kids to use. And uh, it was, you know, we had many, many years playing the schools. And that's how we got the idea of, of starting the, the children's workshop. Six children, six children we started, six. Three of them were my kids, okay? My and kids. I know, and I know you've, you, basically you have about two or three generations of young bomberos and pleneros that have come from those oh, children's yes. workshops. Yeah. Oh, yes. Amazing, amazing. Yes. Julio Colón says, oh, Julio Colón, my good friend, yes. That the Rincón Criollo was originally called El Bate Borincano. Ah, ahí lo tiene, Bate Borincano. Yo dije Rincón Borincano, pero ahí lo tiene, Bate Borincano. Because Julio, one of the guys, you know, who used to hang out all the time. Fantastic. Gracias, Julio. Sí, sí. Now, que, un boricua que tocaba. El gran Julio Colón, <laughs> sí, señor. Here's another great question from Ángel Román. Uh -huh. Is there a specific location in Africa that is the source of bomba? Ah. Uh, you have to, I'm not a scholar in that sense. I used to learn from the, uh, the old Puerto Rican, uh, the old timers, you know. And there's, I know there's uh, a lot of people who have uh, really, you know, gotten deep in studying the, the roots and all that. And probably they would say the Congo, el area del Congo, you know. And uh, that's where it basically originates all this, uh, foremost rhythms of, of La Bomba. Yeah. And for those of you, the Congo is what we would call Zaire today, which is West Central Africa. Okay. Now, here's a great question. Uh, how did how did Juan meet the great uh, vocalist Sami Tanko, who oh, became wow. part of those Pleneros? Sami Tanko you know, when we used to go and hang out at Central Park with the, all the fiesta de Boricua, you know, it was La Palaja Puerto Ricana, Fiesta Folklorica, whatever happened. You know, maybe the, 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 a lot of people that are listening or watching that are too young to, to, to know that the park was open 
report to the public for people just to come and hang out and do things. When Puerto Ricans came into the park, we did all bacalaitos and all kinds of stuff in the grounds. All right, when there was a fiesta, the fiesta was really happening inside the park. You know, the uh, parada ahí, pero you had to go in the park, and that's where the fiesta was really. And then, you know, Sammy used to used to sing all the time. He used to sing la rumba, pero en la plena, eh, you know, because Sammy, as you know, Sammy is very uh, charismatic guy. He's big charisma, and he used to have this long beard, una trenza aquí. In la, in la Chiva, uh, singing plenas, you know, and then I, I remember the, the times when uh, Marcial had to leave and Benny was leaving the group, and so I need singers, and I I went to him uh, because I already met him, you know, in this, in this, uh, in this plenazos over there, and I asked him if he would, you know, be kind to join the group. So he joined the group, and a year after, uh, he brought, uh, his sister Nelly, right? Yeah. Nelly Tanko. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Sammy, uh, I must say, is a very striking figure because, as Wango said in Spanish, Sammy ha has a Fu Manchu had a Fu Manchu uh, mustache that occasionally he would tie up, etc. Yeah. Uh, very handsome black man, and uh, I I didn't know. Uh, this is something I learned just now that I didn't know that Sammy sang Cuban rumba, Guavancoy. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Also, La Plena, he was, you know, that's what he really loved to, to, to do, you know. Now, here we have a question that when we were studying with Puntilla, Bata, uh, and uh, were, did we study together, both me and you, we were, we were studying, did we study together with Puntilla, you know? Well, you know how it was, you know, Puntilla used to bring the drums, and there was uh, also a guy who used uh, to play the... Well, he used to play La Caja, and then we all, the you know, the, the, the newcomers used to play the the, 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 the concolo all the time. Uh, everybody had to get one of those little drums to start playing, you know, and that's, um, we used to play the music. You start the, the uh, el, el ritmo, el, el, el aire que fuera, we had to, we had to do it right there. Kila, kila, kikila, kikila, whatever. Kikila, kila, kila, kikila, kila, kila. Olvídate. Pero eso, uh, that was uh, some experience. Uh, puntilla, puntilla is puntilla, as you know. We're talking about Orlando Rios, the great puntilla who is no longer with us. Yes. And uh, the other part of the question was explain what the bata are there. These hourglass shaped drums that come from Yoruba tradition in Nigeria, and they were reborn in Cuba in the 19th century. Yes. And they're two truncated cones. One head is called the cha-cha, the other one, the large, the small head, and the large head is called the enu. The big drum is called the iya, or the mother drum, also known as the caja. The middle drum is the itotele, or omelenko, and the small little one is called the okonkolo. Yes. And when you start learning, you apprentice on the Oconcolo, and uh, yes. they're the closest thing that we have to Africa in terms of, besides the barriles de bomba, mm -hmm. etc., to that we have to Africa. Okay, I think that is the that was the last question, and we're at the one hour and thirty minute mark, which is perfect, <laughs> a perfect, a perfect time to end this. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, if you missed any of this or want to watch it again, you can do so because it will play again and it'll be in the archives on the Bronx Music Heritage Center uh, Facebook page. Wango, this has been a treat. Uh, maybe wow. we could do part, we, maybe we could do part two because talking about the future, el futuro of the bomba and plena, it has a bright future that, and, and that bright future is be, basically because of you, as I said before, this man won the National uh, Endowment of the Arts Heritage Award, the highest award that any uh, musician can get for their work in preserving folklore in the United States. So that's a pretty, pretty big honor. So as a fellow percussionist and a fellow Puerto Ricano, we are so incredibly uh, proud of you and how you've maintained 
your the dignity uh, of the uh, the Puerto Rican uh, 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 these Puerto Rican musical traditions and pass them on uh, for so so many years when you could have because you had a successful career as a percussionist in Broadway and in pop music and in jazz, you could have continued in that, but mm -hmm. you decided to devote your life, your entire life to these traditions and we're all the better for it. So on behalf of the Bronx Music Heritage Center and Elena Martinez, oh, we, yeah. we thank you and we love you. Like Duke Ellington said madly, si quieres decirle algo al público en español, en Spanglish or in, or in English. In English, <laughs> uh, you know, it's been, it's been a huge, a huge honor really an incredible uh, pleasure and the, you know the best of it that huh? uh, the best part is oh, okay. talking you and me talking good old friends of, of you know of times of, of those times that we remember and not only that we remember on our own but also remember of together you know getting going together doing it doing things together and that happens with you know uh, when you live uh, a long, fruitful life. And we, you know, I wish you many, uh, the greatest health and greatest fortune and, you know, greatest success in your career, in your life. Okay? De verdad te lo digo. Muchas gracias. gracias. Likewise, que viva Puerto Rico. And remember, ladies and gentlemen, the pandemic is only temporary. La música y la cultura es para siempre. The music and the culture is forever. My name is Bobby Sanabria. You've been listening to the great maestro Juan Gutierrez here on Percussion Discussion from the Bronx Music Heritage Center on behalf of Elena Martinez. Buenas noches. Good night y mucho H. Cuídense. Bendiciones.